Without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to Dr. Abad, who will facilitate conversations around colorism and its effects on familial and professional dynamics. Pulling from field work in response to their recent exhibit titled, Two Cultures, One Family. Dr. Abad aims to unpack the meaning and implications of colorism in our everyday lives. Thank you so much, Harlan. Um, it's good to be able to talk to fellow alum and, and folks connected to DePaul. Uh, I am grateful for my DePaul years because um, I wouldn't have thought to be a college professor without them. So a little bit about me, born and raised in Chicago, and for those of you who are familiar with the Chicago Nonprofit Network, um, I am an alum of the Daniel Murphy Scholarship Fund. At the time, it was a foundation. Um, and shortly after, and as soon as I graduated, I entered DePaul University's Latino, Latin American and Latino Studies program um, because I was excited to have professors who looked like me. It's been a long journey from there. Um, what did I do at DePaul? I was a, I was in the STARS Peer Mentor Program. I was a McNair alum. I lived in what was a mate, which I think is the Vincent Louise house right now, um, as a senior. And along the way, got my PhD, did some community organizing, and now I'm a communications tenure track professor at a small liberal arts minority serving institution called Nevada State College right outside of Vegas. So but as we begin, um, the way I like to conduct webinars is much like I conduct course discussion. Um, where first I'm gonna ask how you understand the concept of colorism. We'll spend three to five minutes on that. And then I'll address comments or questions you have in the chat for 10 minutes before I move on to connecting your comments to this art show I recently curated, it just ended. Um, and then pull from the show examples of different kinds. Yeah, of examples of colorism in terms of both response and the pieces themselves. And then we'll open it up again for discussion. Since there aren't a lot of us here, hopefully this can be a fruitful dialogue um, where we think through and unpack colorism um, and, its, and its conversation with racial injustices. So here are my first couple of questions for you. What comes to mind when you hear the term colorism? You can type in the chat, because um, I will stop screen sharing and read those. And then what does it mean for me, thinking visually, thinking what, oops, sorry. You think my name tells you, um, what does it mean for someone like me to be presenting? And so, yeah. I'll give folks about three to five minutes to post in the chat. I will also copy the questions into the chat. Um, so yeah, thank you for all of those who've responded. Um, I'm I'm reading I'm reading your comments and and thinking through how to piece them together, right? And so as as Leah Fox says, um, colorism can be thought first of as light skin versus dark skin. In other words, um, as many of you have said, colorism, like Jasmine, colorism is showing favorable partners to a certain skin tone within one ethnic group or another. Um, and, and that preferential treatment also, right, pref preference also translates into treatment, which then it translates into opportunities. Um, yeah, house of pain, that's a whole mood. And so, Right, so we can think of popular culture examples. The one that comes to mind, for example, is when people compared black represent U.S. black representation in television in the '90s versus now. Whereas now, a lot of the actors and actresses um, pass the the brown paper bag test, as in they're lighter than a brown paper bag. A practice that had been used across various institutions um, in the mid 20th century to judge someone's value or ability to gain access to specific institutions. And so now in a, in a supposedly post Jim Crow era, it factors into how people are treated romantically, professionally, and what's expected of them. 
And while so much of colorism is rooted in, for example, what you see, there are different ways we look or listen for color um, in the way folks exist. One of the things that comes to mind, and, and when I was thinking of putting this together is, at first I wanted to right, focus on um, focus on what we see, right? Because that's what we understand. One second. I made big and then forgot to share. Here we go. Boom. Right? We can think of hair texture. We can think of skin color. We can think of um, the crown act as a byproduct of colorism because colorism is, is skin color as much as hair texture, it can be argued. Um, we also think through in terms of the service industry when it comes to colorism and this emerged in, in work I had done around Puerto Rico, who gets to sit at the front desk and who gets to sit at the back desk. Uh, it also informs standards of beauty. Um, and while the term colorism is primarily a U.S. African American term understood as a byproduct of internalized oppression, um, the debates around skin color are global are are global are global in the sense that various communities, not just the African American community, grapple with measuring someone by their skin color. As much as colorism is a byproduct of white supremacy, in which the lighter skinned you are, the easier your hair is to manage, the closer you, you are to whiteness, um, to paraphrase one of my students who talked about proximity to whiteness, it's really about this historical practice and preference to try to distance one's self and one's family and one's community from institutional, AKA structural racism through leaning towards proximity to whiteness aesthetically. And oftentimes, whether in what is now the US and even across the Americas and the Western hemisphere, a lot of folks over the centuries had intentionally or unintentionally tried to bring themselves and their descendants closer to whiteness through intermarriage. Um, and if and when someone could pass or was ethnically ambiguous enough to not necessarily be categorized as black, colorism and its cousins across the globe aimed to um, create social scripts by which individuals could be as close to whiteness as possible so that they would experience less discrimination. In the 21st century, however, I would argue colorism and its this and its cousins and children have changed, which is why it comes back to me um, in terms of thinking through this through all of the senses. We're looking at hair, we're looking at skin color. And in the same vein, thinking about how many people have touched my hair, asked me about my hair, right? Touch is a key factor. When I have my hair natural. I've, I've had folks touch my hair without my permission because it's otherness is intriguing in the same vein, when it comes to touch and, and this light skin versus dark skin, not just around hair, but around skin color, it's really about this point of contact of intimacy and the entitlement to intimacy because of how one negotiates their proximity to whiteness. In the same vein, because not all, all of us are seeing, it can be, people are also judging people on how they sound on the phone. As in, you don't sound black, you don't sound brown because of your education. I remember being younger and my mom completely appreciating my vocabulary and my articulation because for her, I feel, right? As, as someone who could pass having a, child who couldn't, she wanted to make sure I could sociopolitically survive in arenas that would think less of me. Um, and in the same vein, there are smells and tastes we associate with racial subjects in what is now the US in ways that 
connect to the colorism project of judging someone by their skin color and hair texture and their overall aesthetic as being as close to whiteness and therefore humanity as not. And oftentimes when we think of skin color, we can't, it doesn't stop there for us because what's what our skin color and our physical proximity to whiteness allows then translates into not only te- interracial tensions, but also intraracial tensions with regards to what our responsibilities are to our communities, what it means to be accessible and palatable to white to a white majority, um, as well as whether or not our ability to exercise and take advantage of that proximity or the negotiations we make in taking specific responsibilities or not, then translate into forms of racial justice. So before I continue, I want to check in with the audience and see if there are any following or concluding thoughts or questions. Great question, um, Celissa. For me, the, the way I connect colorism to smell and taste is how specific foods and specific aromas and specific like perfumes, right? There are scripts associated with perfume that aren't just gendered, but racialized. And in the same way, food can be as well, right? Like watermelon. Um, And in terms of, of smells, right? I'm thinking about how, and, it's been a while since I've paid attention to perfume. But when I was in middle school, like Cool Water and CK had a racial racial norming, right? When I went to high school, which was a completely different socioeconomic, socioeconomic um, community than the one I came from, which was also a lot less racially diverse, there were different perfumes folks would wear that would hint at a form of racial quoting, right? Um, I think, and and yes, coconut scented oil, for example, or something as simple as the products we use in our hair, right? I use a lot of coconut based things. I use coconut, um, not coconut, cholesterol conditioner, because that's what I learned from my aunt, my Dominican aunt. And so all of these hints, all of these smells hint at otherness or assimilation in ways um, that complement an aesthetic, a colorist aesthetic that lends us and and prompts us to lean closer to whiteness, um, either as a survival mechanism, um, as in it's intentional, right, and proactive, or as a byproduct of how people respond to us for being different. How we eat, exactly how we eat our chicken, Um, the level of salt in our food. And and one of the things that was, that I like, I I run into a lot with, with, when I think about race and food is the palate to which we are exposed and how the palate lends itself to to understandings of racial diversity on an everyday level. Um, As many of us Chicago born and raised, or even those of us who have lived in Chicago for a while, we can attest to how people's comfort with different cuisines is, is either a byproduct of their access or a symptom of their insularity. Um, and the way access and insularity are perceived by the greater public oftentimes get racialized in terms of if you haven't eaten this kind of food, it's a class and and by extension, racial signifier of your access um, to institutions and cultural norms of power. So, yeah. Great question, um, Celissa. That part, yeah. Because colorism lends itself to eventually becoming about class. We, it's difficult to talk about class without talking about race in this country. And 
So much of is it a, it so much of it is about food. Historically, for example, the paler you are, your paleness equated less work in the sun, right? And while the darker the berry, the sweeter the juice is no longer a standard of physical beauty, tanning is, is perceived in a certain way and sexualized in a certain way. I'm thinking about um, in my women in media class, students were talking about Ari Ariana Grande as performing brown face in terms of her aesthetic, which she can as an Italian American. However, um, uh, much like the the debate, the early debates around the Crown Act, if if folks are if folks who are organically and naturally darker or have textured hair live in that comfortably, they're per often perceived socially as less than. Young femme students are pushed to the back of the classroom for having their froze out, right? But there is this practice among those of European descent, those who are pale skinned, where they can dip their toes into black and indigenous aesthetics, appropriate it without expense at their political professional value. Unlike black, indigenous, and other folks of color who have to contend with how as a result of centuries of colonialism, it is norm to view their our value by our skin color and by our ease and act our ease in accessing dominant society spaces. So here's a picture of this picture was a, was a contentious picture for a variety of reasons for the for this art show. But before I explain that, I'm going to rewind. This is, um, so the Daniel Murphy Scholarship Fund was able to send my twin sister and me to an East Coast boarding school in Massachusetts. I grew up in Uptown, went to a small Catholic school that was a large immig immigrant community, Filipinos, Latinos, um, a, a scattering of African-Americans. Um, and so I went to Deerfield Academy in Massachusetts, um and for the and everything about how i understood the world drastically changed i wanted to use this picture as the press release and the primary image um bringing the show together even though it displayed in the show itself for a couple of reasons one i wanted to talk about different colors existing within one family without saying it explicitly so I'm in the black plaid shirt. My sister Melissa's next to me. Then it's my grandmother. Then it's my mother. And so this picture does a couple of things as a text. It highlights the fact that even though I'm relatively darker skinned, my mother and grandmother were pale skinned. My grandmother is a pale skinned person, could dye her hair blonde. And the joke was she was confused with a Polish immigrant um, when walking the streets of Chicago but we're Puerto Rican, right? Um, my sister and I are, are are darker skinned and though we're technically lighter than my father. Um, and we're entering into a world where as scholarship students, we have a social stigma around our socioeconomic status that the society of the school used to measure our value. However, PhDs later, my sister works at Stanford, I work um, at Nevada State, we've, we've made a career of disrupting racial and, and socialized norms. And like I had said when I had introduced myself, as one of two dozen faculty of color in Southern Nevada who works full time, I wanted to highlight a picture of my mother producing two PhDs to disrupt the notion that folks of color couldn't produce first-gen PhDs of color. Oftentimes, because we don't get it to see ourselves in a curriculum, we don't get to see our struggles and our resilience in the curriculum. And this show was a way for me to normalize that. At the same time, part of the contention was when the institution was putting together their press release, they did not want this photo as the main image for the press release. And when the museum director told me this, 
I then responded to not have the photo I chose is a form of racial violence because of the precise narrative this photo tells. Even if you don't know this is boarding school, the caption that says, Drs. Melissa and Erica Abad at a minority serving institution in one of the worst counties in school districts in the country that is filled with black and brown students, there's something I'm saying without saying it. That there can be two PhDs, two doctors in a family, two doctors of color in a family, and they can look like us. They can be darker than us, arguably. And we can do this, right? Because these forms of visibility and representation, not which were part of the reason I went to DePaul in the first place, right? Help us change the script as to what is possible for us. And if we are not, if we, those of us within dominant institutions are not mindful of how photography and forms of representation can disrupt what is expected, then we're not really paying attention. And in not really paying attention, we lose sight of key opportunities to point to what is ex what expectations we assign to people's skin color, right? So in that, in our first year, I had more friends than my sister, in part because I lived on the floor with students of color and my sister did not. So she was in my dorm all of the time because she was the only woman of color on her floor, I would argue in her dorm at the time. And I was not, we had different racial experiences within that institution. And while, she, and while we both do equity and diversity work as careers, um, she does more consulting than I do, um, right? Those formulations of how we existed as, 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 as folks of color in the spaces we occupied, right, within those moments had a drastic influence over how we existed in space. And while she and I could converse around that, there were also often debates we had around what our social responsibility meant. That doesn't come out in the picture. That's, I mean, that's life, right? Um, you can be twins and go through some major stuff together and have different outlooks. And not just because your sister's straight and you're queer, but for other reasons as well. And, and those everyday practice, everyday interactions around our skin color, our hair, from where we sleep to who our doormates are, right? To where we can occupy space, to who decides to work with us, so often starts with how our skin color is perceived. And so when I was putting the show together, this art show together, it was important for me to highlight that and to, to spark dialogue and conversation around it especially because my skin color and being different than my mother's created an opportunity for critical understanding of the reality that I was negotiating the meanings of my skin color since I was born. Um, and so in that vein, I want to turn it back to you to, to see folks' thoughts and considerations with regards to the role of family and skin color. I'll give folks like three minutes before I, I dovetail back in. These are powerful comments and, and stories and, and thank you for sharing. So I'm gonna use Elaine's question and, and tie people's responses together. So I hinted, well, I said that my aunt used to work, ran a salon. She ran a salon, um, I think the first 10 years of fifth. 10 years of my, no, about the first 12 years of my life, she ran a salon um, in Uptown on Wilson and Damon. And then um, when she moved, she she did it at Koreatown and then um, Little Korea by Lawrence and Kimball. And then um, before the pandemic, she was at Cicero, I think at Armitage. It's been, a, it's been over a decade since I was back. I don't remember. Anyway. And so I bring that up to answer the question, uh, to answer Elaine's question of the personal while also connecting it um, to Seltzer's comment about 
um, their Dominican daughter-in-law um, not having an African-American experience. And so oftentimes, um, even though I don't like him, I want to mention, mention him. So Juno Diaz's early work does a really good job of, of bringing Afro-Dominican experiences in to light um, and, and doing so in a way that acknowledges U.S. De, like African diaspora blackness and puts it in that conversation. Rewinding to my own personal experiences and the varied tensions and dynamics among um, the African diaspora and the Caribbean on arriving in the U.S., depending on the island, depending on the colonial history, their slash our engagement with, with blackness and hair and texture and proximity differs because of the, the narratives of, of nationalist, um, the narratives of independence and also, and what independence and nationalism projects sought to prioritize. So as a person who's Puerto Rican and Dominican, I understand the racial grammars I had to follow as a Dominican were very different from Puerto Rican. And I also understand that's probably why my mom had my aunt do my hair every week. Now, having said that, um, when I was three, after a year spending a year in Puerto Rico with my grandmother, my grandmother had my hair cut off without asking my mother's permission so it could be easier to manage. Um, once it grew out, my mom then sent me to my aunt's salon. And I'm bringing this up in conversation to then to share one of the art series of art pieces I had in the show um, because it high, because of what of how Lisa Jarrett, um, who sculpted this, and I started talking about hair. And so when we met, it was the time I got rid of my straight irons and my blow dryers. And so she said, give me a wall. And she gave me three pieces where she's weaving hair um, with each other as a way to reconnect to her African ancestors. Now, when she's talking about hair, which um, is a primary tool across her work, she wants to bring attention to racial tensions while affirming black beauty and affirming natural black beauty, right? Going back to your comments, um, right? And, and as you're talking about family members who want long hair, which is coded as straight, different countries um, like the, including the Dominican Republic, um, privileged whiteness. We see that we can, historically, we can see this in the passage of the policy in the mid 2010s where Dom the Dominican Republic nation, if you didn't have Haitian ancestors that predated 1929, you were being sent back to Haiti, which developed huge outcry, right? Um, and, and, or when I was in Punta Cana 15 years ago, 17 years ago, and Hotel employees are saying, be careful because they're criminals. And all I think is you're hiring undocumented Haitians, but you're criminalizing them at the same time. This ain't my first rodeo. And so I bring this up to say that these, ten these tensions around race, especially in tourism, manifest in who works where and who works where then translates into how we celebrate different forms of aesthetic because these forms of aesthetic aren't tied to service. Um, so yeah. And so thinking about the, the impact of colorism and, and the choice to pass, it's a consistent form of tension. Um, I remember talking to my cousin about why his sister who's younger than me and darker than me was struggling dating because he didn't think about her darkness because he was white passing, um, for example, right? Or I can think about why my brother and I don't talk about racial dynamics because I'm keenly aware that between our last name and the ambiguity of our skin color, where we land informs how we're treated um, despite the fact that he's a veteran, despite the fact that there are generations of my family serving the military, that's not what comes off in our skin color, right? And this good hair, bad hair conversation that Jasmine's bringing up was often brought up in family. We were often discouraged from dating, this is the Dominicans, 
dating my dating African Americans. Um, in contrast, even though my mom and aunt both married um, men of African descent, right? I still had family friends looking at my nieces and nephews saying, thank God your grandmother, Puerto Rican one, got her white grandchildren. But yes, she still loved you. And so there's a permeate. So <laughs> colorism runs rampant in everyday conversations. And the fact that the woman who told me that my grandmother finally had her white grandkids was a woman of Af Afro Puerto Rican descent was mind boggling to me. But then I, but then I have to think about how normalized it was to think white was right. Um, and if you weren't white, your goal was to then be as close to white as possible through marriage and making sure your kids were born light skinned. I'm catching up on comments and, and thank you for sharing. And, this, and, and, and what Carrie Thomas is, is talking about in terms of where are you from, where are, you, uh, where are you from is a loaded question when your skin color is supposed to mark you as different, um, right? And, and people saying it makes sense because you're dark. What they're saying is your citizen, <laughs> it can be argued that what they're saying is that your your, the othering of your citizen to your skin color is now socially validated because I was right in not thinking you belong here. And, and, and something as simple as where are you from, especially if it's an interracial inter dynamic is incredibly powerful. Um, about a decade ago, I, wrote, I, I started writing an essay um, looking for home because I know that when pale skinned and white people ask me where I'm from, they're asking me whether or not I'm a citizen of their country, a political one or otherwise. When the children of immigrants who are darker skinned and see my last name and see family or see how hear how I speak and see family. When they ask me where I'm from, they're asking me if I understand their struggle. And so much of that has to do with the perception of skin color and names and accents. And so, and, and when we're talking about the racial hierarchies in this, in the United States, even as we bring the racial hierarchies from the places we come from, the one in the United States tends to win out and the ones from where we come from tend to, um, tend to get stronger in the places where they complement the US racial grammar. And by grammar, I mean social code and scripts. Yeah. And diminishing blackness, whether through um, acknowledging or, or or tracing Native American heritage, um, or, or or naming their white families, is often an attempt to because Afro Indigenous dynamics and struggles is a different conversation. Um, but in terms of like trying to find that white relative, something that I struggle with my brother doing, um, right? It's an attempt to validate our citizenship and humanity in the process. You know, one of the things as I'm looking, as I'm reading some of your, or your comments, right, is I'm thinking through the DNA test to prove where we're from. I'm also thinking through how, how often we're, how, how often our skin color lends its, and how it's perceived lends itself to imagining a lineage where racial labor exploitation is divorced from us or that we can find ways to escape it by finding other avenues of, of tying ourselves to whiteness and white privilege. And, and thinking about Alison Braun's um, comment about Korean and transracial adoption, transracial adoption adds yet another layer to dynamics of colorism, not only because not only because we're waiting to hear um, about the repeal of the Indian Child Welfare Act, also because different ethnic communities, um, especially the Korean among other Asians that are adopted by white families, um, according to Kim Park Nelson, who herself is a transracial adoptee, and she writes about this in Invisible Asians, it's this loss where you're raised by people who love you and are taking care of you, but often don't take the time or the energy to learn about your racial otherness 
And while some co ethnic communities are building like culture camps to help adoptees reconnect with their cultures of origin, oftentimes if they find them as adults, if they find them, they find them as adults and then are also having to process this othering that while well, on the one hand, they're economically in a better place than, than they would be if they stayed home. But on the other hand, have all of these racial tensions that they have to then spend the rest of their lives unpacking. Um, yeah. And so, and, and, even, and, and being outside of this country, our accents and our skin color lend itself to how we're treated there. One of the beautiful things my sister said is that when she went to Tanzania, they mistook her as one of theirs, right? Um, I'm like, well, our ancestors are from all over, so that makes sense. But in terms of how our accents are treated and how our skin color is treated, definitely then relay going to Elaine's comment to how people perceive us in this country. When people ask me where I'm from, because I talk about race and gender for a living, I, I tend to delay the answer of my parents' birthplaces unless I'm talking to a person of color. And I do that because it, for me, um, I'm uh, having to consistently explain my otherness to then make someone else comfortable annoys me. And yet again, right, whether it's because of our accent, our skin color, our name, or our hair texture, folks whose ancestors or community members are either are, are from the global south or historically colonized spaces have to consistently explain our existence in the space. Um, but yeah, and so, and and yeah, and I'm particular about who gets, I don't get my hair done anymore because I live in Vegas and while there's a community of folks who could take care of it, um, my aunt was a beautician, so I'm picky. And also I'm picky because I'm reluctant to walk into a racially tense dynamic just to get my hair done or even cut. Um, and I often, and, and the one time I had someone cut my hair, I positioned myself as someone who grew up on my aunt's beauty salon chair, as in don't mess with me because there's so much racial, there was such a struggle to not have to do blowouts anymore with my mom that I don't want to replicate those struggles when there's a, when I got to pay people, because that's disrespectful to me. So here's a um, question for folks based on my, based on my notes and where I want to get this conversation going. Where, and I'm typing it in the chat, and how do you see, what's the word I'm looking for? Colorism play out in your workplace. We talked a little bit about family dynamics um, with myself and others as case studies, um, but we haven't really talked about it in our workplaces. So I'll give folks five minutes while I get some water. Thank you, B. Seltzer, for your point. I'm going to jump in on that for a number of reasons. So as a McNair alum, I'm one of the 4% of McNair alum to receive their PhDs. Unfortunately, despite the growth of the program across the country, there is no data on how many McNair PhDs actually get tenure track jobs given the market. Okay. In addition to that, I'm, I'm hopping in on Seltzer's claim for another reason, across social media, when folks look at DEI work, D diversity, equity, and inclusion work, rarely do you see people of color in those positions, as in the majority of those positions um, tend to be held um, by white folks, white women specifically. In my sister's dissertation work, which backpacks off of some of what folks are saying here, she found that white women with masters were getting paid more than immigrant women, mostly of Mexican and other Latino and Latin American descent, for doing the same level of work and the same kind of labor. And while degrees should be valued, the nature of the valuing, especially when it was in around work serving immigrants, um, lends itself to acknowledging that there are specific people who can grow and professionalize community advocacy 
and that insiders of those communities really can. Um, Allison Brand, the majority of, uh, Braun, Braun, sorry. So one of the struggles in, in the Clark County, which is where Las Vegas, the Las Vegas Valley School District, is not only do we have a teacher shortage, is that the majority of student teachers are white and the majority of students are Asian American, um, Latin A and black. In other words, um, across the country, the majority of teachers are white women, um, which speaks to the, and the divestment in education speaks to the feminization of education, much like um, citing Heather McGee and the increased diversity of public education in terms of integration, then that, that also lent itself to more divestment. And the greater divestment discourages many of us from teaching K through 12 because we want to make a living wage without burnout. Um, I've had one of my cousins was in public schools and she's like, I can't do the change I, I want here. I was friends with Golden Apple Scholars um, who attended DePaul and they left for similar reasons. All of these folks are women of color for context, right? And so going back to Elaine's comment of who can do what, college faculty see this in our evals. I've had many a conversation with colleagues of color about how if I'm teaching the same way with the same deadlines and the same boundaries as a white woman colleague and I get worse evals, that's not about me. That's about structural racism. My iWatch tends to speak when I don't want it to. And, and I point to that because even something like evals, which are gendered in race and implicit bias runs rampant, it's so covert and it takes meticulousness and and habit and, and the habit of being judged more, right? And the hypervigilance um black and brown folks have to engage to read with to read the subtext of they're disorganized or they're not consistent or they don't respond. Because even people of color who are invested in anti-racist work often lean on white folks as a site of authority and only lean on other people of color who can bring them to proximity to whiteness. Um, and oftentimes to go to Alison Braun's question of, you don't know if um, it's because white people are being hired over black and brown, part of it stems from it's not just being hired over, it's also the experience of um, potential educators in the classroom. I've had many a student across the institutions at where I taught um, in Southern Nevada state that as much as they want to be a teacher, the everyday racism they hear from teachers in their classrooms has been enough for them to not want to pursue formal routes to licensure. Um, the other reality is, um, in terms of not choosing teaching professions, it's also about if the, the, the toll of being one of the few. Um, the other reason I, I, I brought in, the, in the, my first picture from DA and talked about that is, um, so Daniel Murphy at the time could pay for two, seat, two full ride seats at Deerfield. However, and luckily, my sister and I went at the same time, so we so we could be each other's community. However, there were a lot of other nonprofits that were only sending one student, and we had we had classmates from California, from Jersey. Um, there was a large nonprofit from New York that sent a handful every year, but oftentimes, and even if those for those students who didn't come, students of color who were scholarship kids who didn't come with a formal organization they were navigating terrain completely by themselves. And while some of us went corporate and some of us went education, right? We were having conversations about being one of the few from very early on. Um, high, in high school, a, a common narrative I heard from, from folks was they could look at us, but not touch us in terms of interracial dating or, or dating in general, right? or the, the few black and brown women who did end up dating white men, their white female friends weren't, they lost them in the process. What's more, I had, I had friends and dorm mates who once parents came to visit, they were estranged from their housemates. 
and I chalk this up to Allison's question as to why black and brown folks don't teach, oftentimes what we have to contend with is do we want to be the only one in the in the space? What is the labor that entails? Um, right? On a psychosocial level. And then we have to look at the economic benefits of being an educator. When I walked into DePaul, I was dead set on being a high school teacher. And then my professor said, I should think about grad school. And while I like, I loved working with high school students when I wasn't a college professor, because I wasn't always a college professor, I often find, found myself being one of a few or having to negotiate the racial exploitation of how my, my students' narratives were written, um, the lack of critical analysis of, or awareness of nonprofit board members and nonprofit leaders when it came to the needs of working class, black and La Latino students, or right, the critical understanding of what it meant for me as a person of color to work with youth of color in a predominantly white institution. Um, and navigating that terrain as some of the youth I worked with didn't know how to respond or didn't see the exploitation in the generosity of their white classmates was really a lot of work. And out of the few, and I'm thinking about my work with Boys Hope, Girls Hope in Evanston. And out of the, the three women of color who were there at the same time, the one who stood the longest stood the longest because she because of the relationships she she made with the young folks. But when she reported back on her work, she often discussed how little the student, the young people's racial struggles were taken. And oftentimes professionals of color, we need to contend with what our existence in particular spaces and institutions does in either perpetuating racial inequality um or right or contributing to it beyond what's the word i'm looking for beyond the fact that our existence won't fix it right i mean i feel incredibly privileged to be at a minority serving small liberal arts college with 10 percent latino faculty and probably 10 percent black faculty because you don't because that doesn't exist um unless maybe at an HBCU and even then, right? And so, and even then, and even despite the fact that there are more faculty of color per capita, I'm still at an institution where during professional development, they don't wanna say structural racism and I'm in higher ed. And thinking about my friends of color who are trying to become public educators, oftentimes, the professional hazing that people chalk up to divestment and not being valued gets racialized where a friend of mine will say, no one wants to share resources with me. And she's the only black teacher in the room. So, so often, right? Like, and, and, and we, and, and we often discuss, would we be treated better because we're light skinned? And with some of my colleagues, we discuss, my awareness that I'm being treated better because I'm lighter skinned or someone else is being treated better because they're lighter skinned. And in that treatment and in that dynamic, we have to contend with a variety of social responsibilities and also exhaustion because we're not white enough to be white, but we're not dark enough to be fully a person of color, um, which is neither our fault. And how we approach that responsibility is not gonna make everybody happy. It's just not. So I'm gonna connect Jasmine's about likable people to skin and skin color to um, Elaine's last comment. So when Jasmine's talking about um, a former workplace where it was less about skin tone and more looking friendly and likable, again, even the concept of looking friendly and likable is raised. Um, for example, one of my one of my DMSF alum, I was at an alumni lunch, and someone talked about how she wore the greased hair and the bun and the tight jeans and the t-shirt, and how she had metamorphosized because she was now wearing J. Crew. And I'm sitting there trying not trying to withhold my tongue and not yell at these rich white men. <laughs> 
But I bring that up to say she became likable because her aesthetic change and her aesthetic change is a survival mechanism, right? Um, going back to the DEI comment that Elaine just posted about the pipelines, a lot of companies not, and I can point to higher ed, and I, and I think what higher ed is doing is symptomatic of what happens everywhere, else, is they'll do a diversity hire pool. Like in higher ed, we call them cluster hires where there's expertise across, like black studies expertise across disciplines, what I like to call the post-George post Floyd, the post-George Floyd effect, right? Where like all these higher ed institutions are being like, let's not be called racist and hire a bunch of black faculty. Um, or even in my own institution, there was a grant to hire a data science person with attention to diversity. And my colleagues kept saying they, they were struggling and then I'm going to connect it to the cluster hire concept. And, I'll, and I wasn't telling these new colleagues because I just got there, but, uh, but I told other colleagues of color, I said, if they were, in co if they were com uncomfortable com enough in being uncomfortable and asking for my help, I would have posted that job call. But if they're not asking for my help, what they're saying is they want the diversity to hire to fail because it helps them state that finding a person of color for their discipline is difficult without acknowledging the fact that it's difficult because they don't want to talk to people of color. So going back to these pipelines, right? So pipelines, um, and my aunt talked about this in Starbucks, where they would like rush to hire a bunch of folks from a specific community. That only works if there's the infrastructure of support, of advocacy for those communities once they get there. If there isn't, which often there isn't, they don't get to stay. And when you're doing a bunch of cluster hires in Black studies or Latino studies, which is the new one that some folks are doing right now is, but you don't make sure that those colleagues know each other, that, that you don't make sure those faculty get dialed into affinity groups, you're hiring them to appease, to address the numbers issue without addressing the climate issue. When I was on a panel around minority serving institutions and the what I like to call the diversity overseer for search committees was on there um, and she was explaining her job, she was being incredibly vague. And after her explanation, I said, so your job is to make sure that committees don't hire based on prestige, but they actually hire folks who wanna work with students of color. And she was like, yes. Even though her job was literally what I explained, she couldn't say that, even if she was in the company of other panelists of color. She had to be safe and guarded with her language because she didn't want to run the offensive. And, and what does that mean if she's supposed to be on these committees telling people, who cares if they went to Harvard? Because if they went to Harvard but don't know how to teach Black and Brown working class students, why are we hiring them? In the same vein, right, when I'm thinking about these pipelines, these pipelines are trying to create short-term solutions to long-term problems. Because who wants to be the first one, in, first one in a company consistently questioning whether or not they deserve to be there? I've had colleagues who would say, I refuse to apply to diversity positions because I'm going to spend my entire time there wondering if I'm good enough because it takes these initiatives to make the case to make these hires because so often we're not looking at them, right? Like I even think about, I even think about the fact that I couldn't get a part-time job at DePaul. My alma mater who trained me to be an activist scholar to disrupt colonialism, right? In my work and research is then telling me I don't have enough training after years I spent community organizing, right? And even though this isn't a form of colorism on, on a visual level, it's an intellectual form of colorism where I'm like, I don't want to reach particular people. I'm not going to go to a school and get into debt. And because I made those decisions, I'm then being deemed as not good enough, especially because I refused to engage in an exploitative economy that is the overrepresentation of part time instructors in higher ed, right? And now I'm catching up with Seltzer's comment about the D head of DEI in the US and Canada is a black woman. One of the people I support is a black partner and we have a black female attorney. And there is an open conversation, but my question to you is, 
what does it mean that there's only one in each of those roles and in each of those units? And what is the emotional labor of being one of a few for them in that kind of work? One of the things I'm grateful for at being at my current institution is um, because a lot there's a lot of staff of color and many of us come from a variety of institutions. We all want to be there and have these critical dialogues, right? In a place like Chicago, and DePaul can be picky about who they hire because Chicago is a prime city because of its ethnic diversity. So DePaul can hire someone from Harvard who wants to work in Chicago because they're sick and tired of Harvard and Harvard's climate, if that makes sense, right? What that what this translates into oftentimes for, for faculty in thinking through these diversity hire the diversity hiring processes is sometimes you're not looked at because of your pedigree. And pedigree then becomes another racial code because of how students of color, immigrant students and queer students have to choose environments in which they will thrive. And oftentimes it doesn't matter what we wanna do because sometimes we may, we, we may wanna do X, we may wanna work in a specific corporate sphere, but we look at that environment and we have to ask ourselves, how long will it be before someone says something asinine that makes me snap? Especially in a post George Floyd, post Breonna Taylor um, political climate. That's great, Seltzer. Um, and the gender disparity of, of diversity um, is important to highlight um, because for for some because for some labor sectors, diversifying with women of color with femmes of color can be easier um, because of the relationship between race, gender, and perceived violent threat, right? Um, which is someone else's wheelhouse, but it's but it's there. Um, and diversifying work um, in an international company, right? Like is also incredibly important so that you can speak to all of your clients and connect with them in such a way. Um, because race also lands differently in different countries um, and racial dynamics. But thanks for that. Um, so with about 45 minutes left, I, I, I kind of want to open the floor and ask folks, um, given what you've heard and considered since the beginning of the web, webinar slash talk, what remaining questions do you have? What feedback or stories do you want to provide um, to keep this conversation going? Mm -hmm. um, I'm on Twitter and I'm also sharing my email with you in boop, boop. Please do. Thank. I just, before we do hop off, I just want to thank you so, so much, Dr. Abad. This was an amazing dialogue and really more of a conversation. Um, we really appreciate that. Uh, we also appreciate everyone who joined us this evening and um, trusted us in this, in this safe space. Um, you can leave any final comments you would like for Dr. Abad in the chat. Again, I just want to hop on to thank you for um, being an amazing host. And again, thank everybody else for this wonderful discussion.